Can you just let me know? Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're going to give you just a minute to all get in the room. Um, we're really excited today uh, for this session on cell block preparation technique. Uh, and I will let Dr. Lomo and Dr. Lowe introduce Dr. Balasanian in just a minute. Uh, but we're just going to let you all get in the room uh, first. So please be patient. Again, thank you for joining. We're just gonna let everybody get in the room. Um, excited about this webinar on cell lock preparation techniques. Just give us a few minutes and we will be ready to go. All right, thanks everybody for joining us today for our Africa Calls cytology session. If you've noticed, we are now going to have a series of four different types of talks, Africa Calls cytology and Africa Calls pathology, which will be these one hour didactic uh, sessions where you can ask questions of the speaker at the end. If you wanna ask questions, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to do that. Um, and we will take those questions at the end and discuss them. We also have the pathologist echo and the cytologist echo, which we're very excited about, which involve uh, a very short, brief didactic for about 10 minutes, followed by two case discussions, and those will be alternating as well. Um, but for today, we are gonna focus on cytology, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Lomo and Dr. Lowe to introduce our speaker. Welcome back participants to the Africa Call Cytopathology series. I'm Dr. Leslie Lomo here from the University of Utah in Salt Lake City to moderate the session. It's my truly my great privilege to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Balasanian is a professor of pathology at the University of California, San Francisco, where his primary clinical activities are focused on FNA biopsy service, general cytology and breast surgical pathology. He is nationally and internationally renowned for his expertise in cytopathology, having published extensively and served as faculty in numerous educational sessions and national and international meetings. Highlights include his development of and ongoing participation in the American Society of Cytopathology's ultrasound guided FNA workshop for the past 10 years and running, his faculty involvement in the College of American Pathologists ultrasound guided FNA certification course, and education in the performance and interpretation of breast FNA biopsy as part of the community-based program for breast health in Peru. His edu educational outreach extends to additional areas such as Botswana, Kenya, and Tanzania. There's truly an adequate time to even touch on his innumerable service and research activities and accomplishments. However, given his extensive work in cytopathology ancillary testing, we're really truly fortunate uh, to have him speak to us today on cell block preparation technique. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Balsanian. Well, thank you very much for that very kind and generous introduction. I'm a little humbled by it. Um, I'm just a simple country cytologist, but let's talk about some cytology and some cell block preparation techniques, um, which I find very exciting. So I'm gonna start with some disclosures. Um, I am a paid consultant by Genentech Corporation um, to develop patient education videos on how to read a pathology report. And those are due to go online in a few days and will be available on YouTube to, for free to patients. But I am paid by them to uh, help develop those. So it'll be a series of five videos. And I have a small amount of stock in Sears Corporation. There'll be no reference to either Genentech or Sears Corporation in my presentation. So our objectives for this for this lecture are to discuss um, different cell block techniques. And I want to really emphasize the importance of fixation for making the best cell blocks. And then also uh, learn about adjusting your FNA biopsy techniques. I'm gonna break some of the rules you may have heard in the past from people. Um, and the goal there is to improve your cell block techniques. 
So let's start with talking about cell blocks. Cell blocks are used in cytology quite routinely now, and we often conflate all cell blocks as being the same. There are cell blocks that we make from fluid specimens, so a pleural peritoneal fluid. Some people, um, including uh, my colleagues here at UCSF, are making cell blocks from urine samples. So anything can be spun down and turned into a cell block. But when we make a cell block from fluids, our goal is different than making a cell block from an FNA biopsy. The goal with the fluid is just to capture a portion of the fluid and have a representative sample. So if you get a thousand milliliters of a pleural effusion, you're not going to turn that whole thing into a cell block. So you use an aliquot of the sample and you first vortex the effusion to break up any clumps and make sure all the um, cells of interest, whether they're epithelial or mesothelial, are evenly distributed in the sample. And then you centrifuge that generally to form a pellet and use whatever cell block technique you want to use from there. FNA biopsy is different. <laughs> it's a different beast in cytology. And I think we need to give more emphasis to this in cytology. FNA biopsy, the goal here, you put a needle into a tumor, ideally, for most cases. Maybe it's an abscess. But your goal here is to capture all of the material in the FNA biopsy that wasn't put onto a slide for a smear. You want the highest yield of cells you can get. And your goal here is also to trap not just tissue fragments, but free floating cells and optimize the cytomorphology while preserving architecture. And I am here to say, yes, there is architecture in FNA biopsies. Any cytopathologist who has experience with FNA biopsies can attest to that. It's different than the architecture we see in surgical pathology, but it's there. The key thing that I find a lot of labs doing when they struggle with their cell blocks is that they vortex the FNA biopsy in the same way that they vortex the fluid. And the reason for that is they haven't developed different standard operating procedures for the two samples. With an FNA biopsy, you don't want to vortex it. You don't want to disrupt the sample. You want to spin it down gently into a pellet and handle it with care. So why do we need cell blocks? Well, they give us so much power for the FNA biopsy. We can do immunohistochemical testing. We can do cytochemical testing. Maybe just a mucicarmine stain will answer your question, or a PAS, or a fungal stain. And very importantly now, cell blocks are a key component for molecular diagnostics. If you're doing any kind of sequencing for a lung cancer or sarcoma, we actually find that our cell block samples work better than core biopsies in many instances. Um, and this has been demonstrated in a quantitative fashion um, by Fraser Simmons and Sanjita Roy at MD Anderson doing side-by-side um, -side sequencing of core biopsies and cell blocks. So molecular diagnostics on cell blocks is really key. Um, the reason it works better on an FNA cell block is that the FNA needle selectively extracts the epithelial component for an epithelial tumor um, and amplifies the, the discohesive cells in the lesion. So you get more of the epithelial cells and less of the stromal component that might interfere with your sample. So you have a richer sample. But even without all of this um, expensive ancillary testing, Having a cell block gives you a morphologic assessment that lets you evaluate the cytology in a different manner and also look at the architecture. So if the case is a struggle, you might find that your surgical pathology colleague who has expertise in lung cancer or breast cancer is going to feel more comfortable looking at an FNA when there's a cell block that mirrors, mirrors some of the findings that they're used to seeing on a core biopsy. So in our practice here at UCSF, cell blocks have become the most critical component of FNA biopsy. So before we talk about cell blocks, we should talk about needles. What's working with the needle? These slides were borrowed from Dr. John Abley with permission. Um, he's one of the founders of ultrasound guided FNA biopsy and really published some good studies talking about how FNA biopsy works. 
when you look at the bevel of the needle here, some people think that, you know, this is the this sharp tip is what you're going to use for your cutting instrument. It's actually not. It's this heel of the bevel, this little edge here on the inside of the bevel. That's what I use to cut fragments that I force into the needle. And sometimes I will even push the tissue into the needle tip when it's a very small lesion as I'm advancing the needle. So I get more of a cutting motion with my needle to catch little fragments. What do I mean with that? by that? This picture, which oh, has gone a little bit askew, but this dark line should be down here. I apologize for that. Um, also from John Abley, when you push the needle forward, you cut these little tissue fragments using this edge here by pushing this forward and these go into the needle. Well, what happens with them then? This is my schematic to try and show that what you're really getting is not separate individual cells, unless you're aspirating something cystic. If you're doing an FNA biopsy on a solid lesion, you should get these little tiny corlets. Um, I do most of my cases, the vast majority, with a 23 gauge needle, and that's big enough that I can get these nice little corlets. A little bit harder with a 25 gauge needle, and I find that a 22 gauge needle is too big. Um, but any size needle, you should be able to get these little corlets that come up through the needle and they'll collect in the hub. Traditional thinking with FNA biopsy, and there are plenty of videos from my colleagues out there that tell you to do this, say at this point, you take the needle and syringe out of the lesion, you take the needle off, you put air into the syringe, and you force all of these beautiful corlets back out through the needle onto the slide and smear it. I'm here to say, no, <laughs> don't do that. So what you can do instead is break the rules, pull back on the plunger to pull all of those corlets into the hub of the needle and the hub of the syringe. In this way, the needle hub and the syringe hub act like a trap and you capture that nice clotted material in here. Take this needle off, and you can either flick this material out the back or get a separate syringe and make smears out of the tip of the needle here that you look at separately. While you're looking at that on your rapid stain, you can decide what you want to do with the material that's left here in the syringe. If you decide that you need a cell block for the case, not flow cytometry or microbiology cultures or whatever, then just gently rinse that out through the nozzle. It seems very simple, but by not disrupting this fragment, by treating it with care, you will actually get little corlets floating in formalin. And that is going to give you a much better cell block. This simple step is all you really need, regardless of what system you're using to make cell blocks, to get much better corlets on your cell blocks. Um, the key thing here are two things. You're pulling the sample back into the syringe, and you're putting it directly into formalin, not into a different solution. And we'll go through and talk about the reasons for that as well later in the talk. Um, and again, treating it with care here um, and not disrupting it. So here's an example. This was a sebaceous cell adenoma thought to be a carcinoma. We would not have been able to diagnose this. We did this biopsy in two passes with the 23 gauge needle. And you can see what I'm talking about. It's a beautiful illustration of corlets. These are really quite long in length. And um, you can see some keratin here, but there's no malignant transformation here. So this patient was spared a diagnosis of squamous cell carcinoma. Here's a benign lesion, same approach, Worthen tumor in a cell block. We have nice tissue fragments. You can actually see the architecture, which is very rare in an FNA biopsy of Worthen's tumor, um, of oncocytes wrapping around papillary uh, epithelial islands here in the classic pattern of a Worthen's tumor. And my favorite case of all time was this poor eight-year-old girl with a Ewing sarcoma arising from the rib, invading into her right atrium. And in one pass with the 25 gauge needle directed towards the heart under ultrasound that I performed, we were able to get this cell block and make a very accurate diagnosis immediately, rule out lymphoma and get her started on chemotherapy the next day with immunohistochemistry 
and fish testing the day after, all on this cell block. Okay, so what's the problem? Why isn't everyone doing it this way? Well, there is no established standard anywhere in any laboratory, at least in the US. We have lots of variation between different laboratories. Everyone has their own sort of, we develop this system, we develop that system, and oftentimes they're not published. The standard operating procedures are kept internal. And um, I think while that might seem like a shortcoming, it also gives us the opportunity to experiment and try out different systems. So um, I'd encourage everyone to look at how they make cell blocks and let everyone know with publications, um, which is sort of how I got onto this topic many years ago and it's become a real focus for me. There are differences in how the tissue is fixed, how it's concentrated, how it's prepared, and also even in the embedding of the sample. And we'll go through some of the different systems. Some of the systems I'll talk about here is rinsing the needle in saline, um, using plasma and thrombin to make a clot, by far the most common system for making cell blocks in the US. And I think that's really unfortunate and should change. Using auger or histogel, these two systems are very similar. There's also millipore filters, filter paper, clotting, salient is a proprietary system, um, and the colloidin bag system, which is the system we use here at UCSF. So let's talk about how these different systems work. So the saline plasma thrombin system, I don't have a good name for it, so I just list all the components here. Oops, press the wrong button. Um, this system is very common. So what happens here is, You've got your test tube, you put your FNA sample in there, and it's the needle is rinsed in saline. And this is then spun down, and you add a drop, or you add a certain amount of plasma, and you add a certain amount of thrombin. That forms a clot, just like a plasma thrombin clot would. You spin it down, you push out the little pellet, and you send that to histology in a cassette, just like a core biopsy. This was um described by Koss and Malamed originally, um, and it's in their book. And the uh, thrombin is available from um, King Pharmaceuticals. However, the plasma, you can get commercial plasma, it's quite expensive. So most labs that use the system end up using discarded plasma from the blood bank. I'll say that again. They use discarded plasma from the blood bank. So my colleagues and I here at UCSF, Diana Ng and um, Poonam Bora, wrote an editorial on cancer cytopathology, and I should have the reference on here. I apologize that I don't. We wrote an editorial in cancer cytopathology in 2021 titled, Stop Using Discarded Plasma for Cell Blocks. The problem with using discarded plasma is that this cell block, depending on the diagnosis, may be needed for molecular diagnostics, for next generation sequencing. And you got plasma from who knows who, thousands of donors with cell-free DNA floating in it. And when you're sequencing the cell block, you're actually sequencing the cell-free DNA as well. Um, Anjali Saki at Columbia did a nice study, also published in the same issue of Cancer Cytopathology, which is why we wrote the editorial, showing that you can sequence actionable targeted, targeted genes that would be targeted for therapy in lung cancer from the plasma that is being used in making these sorts of cell blocks. So this system, even though it is the most common, I think is terrible. Histogel or auger. Histogel is a proprietary substance. It's trademarked. It melts at a certain temperature. Auger that you use in Petri dishes works similar, but you have to work out in your own lab what temperature to melt it at, what temperature to cool it at. For this system, you put your sample into a conical test tube. You spin it down. You decant the supernatant. You can either pipe it that off or pour it off. Pipetting usually works better. Then you add warm liquefied histogel to the sample. It makes a little pellet after it cools on ice and you push that out and you put that into a cassette and send it to histology. 
this system works pretty well. The key thing here is that the FNA was rinsed directly into formalin as a first step. And by doing that, you get much better preservation of the cytology and the little tissue fragments. The colloidin bag technique is a little variation on that. It's the system that we use here at UCSF. So all of the cases that I'm showing you, that I showed you earlier, are using the colloidin bag technique. It's a little bit more labor intensive, at least it seems that way initially. But if you know you're going to use this for most of your cell blocks, you can prepare in advance. So what that means is you take the conical test tube and you fill it with this substance called colloidin, um, and it's a liquefied polymer that is dissolved in ether, um, and that's one of the shortcomings I'll discuss later. You put it in the test tube, you fill it up, and then you pour the colloidin back into the bottle. That leaves a film of colloidin along the inside of the bag. This has to all be done under a, a real hood in the laboratory because the ether is volatile and it can cause people obviously to pass out. So you rinse your needle into formalin and then you pour that entire sample into the colloidin line test tube. You centrifuge that at 2500 RPMs for 10 minutes with an RCF of 1125. The bag will typically separate from the glass test tube here. And if it doesn't, you can gently pull it off. There are labs that use plastic test tubes for this uh, procedure, which also works, but I think the glass test tubes are more reliable. You pull the bag out and you tie a cotton string around the bottom. It shouldn't be synthetic thread. It should just be cotton. And you leave the thread on there um, cut the bag here and you put the bag with the thread on it to the histology laboratory. And the thread, if you use colored thread, will help the histotechnologist know where the cell block is in the paraffin block and help them with um, cutting the sample because they'll see when they hit the thread. And uh, I'll tell you also at the end, I have a YouTube video that goes through all of the steps for this. And uh, you can just click the link here to get to that. Or if you go to YouTube and you search cell block, UCSF, FNA, and uh, my name, it should come up right away. And of course, my name is misspelled here. It's B-A-L-A-S-S-A-N. -S -S I have only one person to blame for that, me. Okay. Those are the three main techniques that I think are most common, but we could talk about some more simple techniques too. This filter technique is pretty straightforward. Um, it's very low cost. It's I've used it many times and it works really well. You need to use lens paper or cigarette paper, something that's a very, very thin and easy for the histotex to cut through if it's embedded in paraffin. Fold it into a small cone, and then you just put the cone on top of a, a test tube. It does not have to be conical in this case. And you pour your sample, your FNA biopsy needle rinsing into formalin. You pour that into the cone and everything will precipitate at the bottom. You take it out and you fold it and um, make sure all the sample is collected into one corner. Some people will add a little drop of hematoxylin on the paper here to guide the histotech so that they can see where the tissue should be. This is placed into a cassette and sent to the histology lab, and they'll just cut through the paper until they reach the sample. So you will have a lot of paper on your slide, but you should also have some material trapped in the little corner there. Um, this is low cost. It can be a little hard for the histotechs with the paper. So if you do use the system, just make sure that it's a uh, a very thin paper that um, they can cut through. And I can't think of any better use for cigarette paper than this system. Even more simple, if you don't want to make it complicated at all, you can use what's called the clot technique. There's two different variations on this. Before, when I talked about taking the needle off, you do that step again, and you let the material just clot here in the hub. So that gives you time to make smears and look at the smears in the microscope for your rapid on-site evaluation. And while you're doing that, this 
should clot up in the syringe, and then you just push it out of the syringe into the formalin. This form formaldehyde or formalin will break up the clot a little bit because formalin is an anticoagulant, um, but there still will be enough fragments to go through um, that, that will still be preserved, even if the blood component of it dissolves a little bit. A variation on that is to just squirt the material back out through the needle. And again, I really don't like this because you're shattering everything as it goes back out through the needle, but you could do that, or you could take the needle off and just squirt it out through the hub of the syringe onto a glass slide and let it clot on the slide. The charged surface of the slide will help with the clotting. And then you could just scrape this off of the slide into formalin. If you are going to scrape a clot off of a slide, it's actually uh, a good idea to use a second slide that you've dipped in formalin already, and that will help lift the clot off of the glass slide, and then you can get that into formalin. And you just process it, process it as you do uh, a small endocervical biopsy or a tiny core biopsy. There are other systems, the salient system, is a proprietary system from Hologic. Um, this was developed to be used with thin prep or liquid-based cytology. In this case, you rinse your needle in cytolite, not formalin, and then <clears throat> the sample is vortex for even distribution. Um, that's in the SOP for the system. Then an aliquot is used for the cell block, and it also uses alcohol fixation. This machine will spit out one block per sample run through it. So it's not really useful for high throughput labs if you have a lot of cell blocks coming out. Um, there are a few issues with this. The vortexing, I think, is a problem for FNA biopsies. And also the alcohol fixation, which is not a stumbling block that they have been able to overcome as far as I know. When you fix a sample, a cytology sample in alcohol, you are limited with the um, immunohistochemistry you can do because the validation needs to be done on formalin fixed tissue. If you revalidate everything on alcohol, then you can use alcohol, but it is a lot of work. Many labs use this if they don't have this system, if they don't have a lot of cell blocks to process every day. It gives you about 10, the cell blocks are very thin, so you get about 10 sections, um, 10 to 20, I believe, per cell block. Another system that was published in Cancer Cytopathology in 2017 is called the cell gel system. This is a modification of the histogel technique. So for this system, you mix the sample with a hemolytic agent to lyse the red blood cells, and then you centrifuge it, you discard the supernatant, so it's very similar to the histogel technique, you transfer that concentrate to this disposable mold and add histogel in the mold. So you get this nice square block, and then you submit that in a cassette that's lined with um, foam or sponge to histology, and they'll process it, and you get a nice little organized cell block like that. Personally, I like to see this work without the hemolytic agent because I actually think the clot helps you capture some of the cell blocks, but this is the system that they've developed and published. The affect system published from can in Cancer Cytopathology in 2016 um, is similar. In this case, you collect the sample in saline, you centrifuge it, you discard the supernatant, then you fix the concentrate only in formalin, centrifuge and decant that. And they developed this um, interesting funnel system here that then vortexes the sample and it goes into the cytospin centrifuge and this absorbent foam receptacle between the funnel and the metal clip captures some of the material in this little tiny pellet, which is then wrapped in tissue paper and put in a cassette and sent to histology. So there's a lot of steps in here, for um, centrifuging, vortexing, and this absorbent foam that's going to break up your clots. So I don't think this is an ideal system for FNA biopsy, but similar to the salient and the other systems I'm talking about here, these might work well for fluids um, if you're just making cell blocks for effusions 
um, and other exfoliative fluids in cytology. So I see that there are some questions. Um, this would be a good time to stop and take questions, or should I just continue on and save questions for the end? It's um, your preference, Dr. Balasanian, in terms of your time. Um, I was I try to think about saving questions to the end, but if you feel you have enough scale to um, address questions in the middle, um, I will leave that up to you. Okay, well, one question here is, what are the alternatives for histogel and auger? The two are not locally available. I have struggled with this. I would think that auger should be available from the microbiology lab, but I have not been able to work, make it work with my colleagues um, at Muhas in Dar es Salaam. Um, it's something that needs investigation. We need an alternative that is less expensive. The histogel actually I don't think it's that expensive. So if you can find a way to get it available, um, I think that would be the ideal system. Uh, but I don't have an easy answer for that. Maybe talk to a microbiology lab in your area and see if they're using um, auger for petri dishes that you can then um, titrate to different concentrations and see if that will work. You just need something to bind the material. And the PowerPoint will be shared, absolutely. Um, that's the second question too. Okay, so let's close that. So let me tell you about why I'm so obsessed with fixative, with formalin. Formalin is a fixative. When I was at my former institution, Mass General Hospital, um, I started there in 2007, and the first thing I noticed on the FNA service was that the cell blocks were terrible. And they're like, yeah, oh, yeah, we have terrible cell blocks, so we do core biopsies for everything. It's like, well, let's see if we can fix it. Um, so they asked me to do a study and prove that there was a better way of doing it. So we compared the system that they were using at the time, the saline plasma thrombin system, with the histogel system and the colloidin bag system. And we also included UCSF in the study as well. We used statistical analysis to identify the best methods. And our goal was to capture, as we said before, all the material in the FNA with single cells and preserve architecture and cytomorphology. So this is a very simple study and it can be replicated in many different settings. And I think that would be really informative um, for the cytology community. We did FNA biopsies on randomly selected surgical specimens. So no patients were involved and we biopsied areas of the specimen that were not going to be sampled for histology. So we didn't disrupt the sample in any ways. For this study, we did four separate FNAs. We did one FNA to make smears, to get a look at the cells and see what is the cellularity of this lesion? Is it a very fibrotic tumor? Is it very necrotic? And just be able to do classic cytology. We did one FNA for the saline cell block system, one FNA for the histogel system, and one FNA for the colloidin bag. We did all four FNAs at the same time, and we did the same number of back and forth excursions with the needle, so we would get the same amount of uh, sample. So it wouldn't be like, oh, I did a longer or better FNA for the colloidin bag or something like that. And you can see we have a range of specimens that we sampled. Um, we processed them all at MGH, and we prepared H&E slides. Then we did a blinded review looking at cellularity preservation architecture and scored the best slides and did the statistics. And overall, the cloying bag was superior in all of these categories. You can see cell block quality. The green bars are the colloidin bag system. And um, cellularity preservation and architecture were all captured with the colloidin bag system. And the histogel and the saline were about equal um, in that regard, with the histogel coming out a little bit better for preservation. I think it's better enough for preservation that it should be used instead of the saline plasma thrombin system. So let me show you some examples. This is just a basic squamous cell carcinoma. Um, we all see this in, in cytology. So here's the direct smear. I've got big tissue fragments on my smear and sheets of malignant squamous cells on high power, keratinizing with some inflammation, and there's some vascularity in this lesion too. So what happened when I rinsed that needle 
from the same lesion in saline. Well, you lose all those fragments and there's all this like nuclei in the background. There's a little bit of preservation. If you gave this to a cytopathologist, they would say this is a squamous cell carcinoma, especially if they had the smears. But if you gave it to a surgical pathologist, they might say mm, atypical cells, cannot exclude, cannot rule out. I don't know what I'm looking at. Get me a core biopsy. That happens. High power. When you look at these cells, these squamous cells, you can see what's going on here. This supposedly isotonic buffered saline that the needle is being rinsed in is actually lysing these cells because even though everyone says it's isotonic, it actually isn't. And I didn't study it in this case, but I could tell you the same thing happens to a lesser extent with RPMI. Nothing is going to be perfectly isotonic with the inside of the cells. So they just explode. However, there are enough cells that have this dense keratin cytoplasm that are preserved that, you know, this system persists because you could still make a diagnosis off of it, but it's not spectacular. So here's what happens with the histogel. Interestingly, the single cells in the background, which is why I'm showing you this low power, most of those do disappear. Now, keep in mind for the histogel system, I rinse the needle directly into formalin, spin it down, and then clot it. So this is now formalin fixation. We do have some preserved architecture. I can zoom in there and you can see, okay, there are tissue fragments here. This is obviously squamous cell carcinoma, no problem. It took me a while actually working with my colleague Anjali Saki at Columbia to figure out what was happening to the single cells in the background that are present in the sample, but don't show up in the histogel cell block. And we think it's the temperature of the histogel that actually um, cooks some of the single cells, but the formalin fixation preserves the tissue fragments here. Now compare those two with the colloidin bag. You can see the bag membrane here along the outside and the tissue fragments are preserved and the single cells are also preserved. It's acts like I try to compare it to like a French press coffee maker where you just pull everything down into a, the bottom of the test tube and you capture all the single cells and these nice tissue fragments and you've got great architecture here. You can even see like maturation of the squamous epithelium and so forth. So if this was a difficult case, you could show this to a surgical pathologist and they would they would be able to work with you on this if you needed to. I have other examples. So we looked at a range of specimens. This is a very discohesive pattern of a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So sheets of lymphoid cells would turn out, which turn out to be quite fragile. Um, and we often see that with the lymphoid tangles and crush artifact that we get with lymphoma smearing, but enough at high power that you can say, yes, this is a lymphoma. With saline, a lot of the sample is just exploded cells here in the background and the tissue fragments very small and very poorly preserved. You can see it looks like it's just falling apart. Here's the histogel, so a little bit more of the single cells in this case and some architecture preserved. With the colloidin bag, we have large tissue fragments that can show you this is really a diffuse growth pattern um, and the cellular morphology, the cytomorphology is preserved with the formalin fixation and the colloidin bag system in those high power cases. The best example though was this solid pseudopapillary tumor of the pancreas. Here with the saline rinse, the cells all exploded, the tissue fragments exploded. It turns out that the cells of this tumor are also quite fragile. Um, we learned a lot about different cell types by doing this study. Renal cell carcinoma, solid pseudopapillary tumor of the pancreas, very fragile. So here with the saline rinsing and the plasma thrombin, or actually this is the smear here, um, showing you that the cells fall apart real easily. With the saline um, plasma thrombin system, we lost most of the cellularity, very few fragments, just nuclear dust here and nothing we could really interpret. 
Histogel may be a little bit better. I could say there's a fibrovascular core here, lined by cuboidal cells. So this is where you start to hear things like most highly consistent with suspicious four. What did we get with cloyden bag? We got papillary architecture, small papillary fragments here and single cells in the background that show it's all one population. And when you zoom in, you could see vessels in the center, fibrovascular cores lined by these small cuboidal cells. And that's really all you need in terms of morphology. Look at this beautiful vessel here with the red blood cell. This is all you need in terms of morphology for making this diagnosis, which is very hard to make in a real world setting. So I'd like to just say again, that formalin is a fixative. When I wrote this paper, we put that line in our conclusions and the editor were like, you have to take that out. That's obnoxious. What are you saying? Everyone knows formalin is a fixative, but they don't. So we left the line in. <laughs> Formalin is a fixative. You need to use that for your cell blocks. It's going to give you the best sample because you can get formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue for ancillary testing. Why do people use saline? Well, there are some advantages for saline. I'll talk about that in a, in, in a minute. But with formalin fixation, whether you're using histogel or colloidin bag, your architecture and cytology can be preserved. You don't have to use those two systems. You can also just use the clot system or the filter system. But as long as the sample is going into formalin first and not some other solution. We found that our colloidin bag system will trap and concentrate all the material. And we um, decided that it's superior for FNA biopsy cell blocks. So why saline? Why are people using this? Well, when the pathologist is not performing the biopsy, and um, a technician or a cytologist is collecting the sample, say from a radiologist or a surgeon, there is this concern that they will put everything into formalin and then you lose your ability to do flow cytometry because you have a sample in formalin. I think if a cytologist, um, formerly called cytotechnologist, if they're involved in the rapid onsite evaluation, they should have the ability to see whether a sample is epithelial or lymphoid or the cases where you can't tell. If it's epithelial, make a cell block. If it's lymphoid, get material for flow cytometry and a cell block. If you can't tell, same thing, material for flow cytometry and a cell block. Many labs collect in saline, bring the sample to the laboratory, process the slides as permanent slides, and then decide what to do with the sample in saline, whether to make a cell block or flow cytometry. I think we need to put that behind us and um, be able to separate at the time of the procedure. When ROSE is not available, rapid on-site evaluation is not available, the sample will sometimes be collected in saline and sent to the cytology lab. And in that case, you are limited, um, but you can work with the clinician collecting the sample or the radiologist and see if they can collect some in saline and some in um, formalin. Um, the advantage of this system is that it's low cost as well. But again, the plasma collected from the blood bank, it's got inconsistent clotting factors. So there are many times where you won't even be able to make a clot with that plasma and you have to start all over. Again, I don't have it on here, but the real issue for me now is that it, you just don't know what genes are in that plasma and what genes are gonna end up in your cell block. So I think it's really a bad idea to do this system. And commercial plasma is just cost prohibitive. Um, so I don't know of any labs that really use commercial plasma. From my perspective, also the loss of cellularity is something to keep in mind. What's the advantage for histogel? Well, you can use formalin fixation directly, so that's good. It is fairly low cost and it's fairly simple. It's very easy to get um, your lab prep people to work with this system. It can be a little tricky when you're starting. If you put too much histogel, your, your cell block is very dilute and very large and hard to work with. If you put too little, it may not clot. The histogel may be affecting the single cell population and the pellets can sometimes be uneven and difficult to cut. 
Colloidin bag, this is what we use here. The formal fixation is ideal. We get superior cellularity preservation architecture, but this does require advanced preparation. So what you can do is if you think you're going to be using a colloidin bag system is you could take a hundred test tubes, glass conical test tubes, pour the colloidin in, pour the colloidin out. Now they're lined and you can fill them with distilled water, cover the top and put them in the refrigerator and keep them, we keep them for up to 30 days according to our standard operating procedure. And the lining will be perfectly fine. Um, so if you make them in advance, then you have them available as you need them. But still there is more work involved, so this can be more time consuming. And the ether solvent is the real problem here. So here at UCSF, our, um, our other hospital, Zuckerberg, San Francisco General, does not use this system because their safety department would not authorize them for using ether in their hood. It has to really be well vented and they just did not have that. There's a really nice write-up from my uh, good friends and colleagues, Susan Rollins and Donna Russell, cytologists at Rochester, that was published in um, CAP Today in 2017. And they just went through and listed some of the advantages and limitations of different cell block methods. Salient is on here, histogel, plasma thrombin, um, the colloidin bag is on here too. So this is a nice reference and you can find the system that works best for your laboratory. Um, the advantage of not having one standard system that everybody uses is that we can experiment with all these different things and share our results and publications and figure out what is gonna work best in different settings. And that's what I'd like to invite everyone to do. If we can find a good cell block system that will work in low resource settings, in low and middle income countries, in Africa, in South America, other places, um, that's equal to what we have here, I mean, we can adopt it here as well, then we can really um, move the field forward. And if there is an alternative to auger, that would be really great. I have tried gelatin, um, just commercial jello or uh, gelatin, um, baking gelatin, and it has not worked well, it shatters. Um, it can't deal with the heat and the cooling, but there, there's got to be a system out there that will work or just work with the clot system. So I'll stop there and say thank you. And also this is a link to my YouTube and it looks to me like we have some questions here. Let me pull that up. Okay. Ah. Thank, thank you so much, Ron, for a wonderful talk. It thank was you. really great and I learned a lot too. So um, <laughs> if you would like to answer the question directly, please go ahead. That's sure. Fine. Hi, Diana. <laughs> I can't see anyone else here. So I'm like talking to myself. But um, so uh, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Diana Ng, who is at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, says that Agaros has worked really well at Muhas in Dar es Salaam. So uh, she she uh, collaborated with me. We were trying to develop a new system for their cell blocks there. And uh, she's led some great efforts in developing FNA biopsy at that institution. And uh, just honestly, I think everything fell apart with the pandemic. So we need to revisit that and see what we can do. Um, and then from Dr. Neithling, the NHLS Cytology Lab, at Tigerberg Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa is developing a special auger for cytology cell blocks. Yes, busy with validation shortly should be available to purchase from 2023 will be very affordable. That's fantastic. And I think I was wondering, can I use tea bags to contain the smears and cassettes? I would try it. You know what? Get a surgical specimen or autopsies also work well and do some FNAs, put it in tea bags and see if your histotech technologists are able to cut through it. I think it should make, uh, it should work well. And from Dr. Henderson Jackson, what about RPMI? Can make cell blocks or use for flow cytometry? Yes, we looked at saline in my study. Um, some laboratories will collect in RPMI and then they have the flexibility of making, oh, I'll use the sample for cell block or I'll use the sample for flow cytometry. I haven't published it, 
but I have done side-to-side -side comparisons of saline flow cytometry and uh, formalin. And even, I'm sorry, saline, RPMI, and formalin. And even RPMI is not isotonic. You lose fewer cells than you do with um, saline, but you don't capture as much as you do with formalin. So what I would suggest you do to answer that question in your own laboratory is we all have that case where we, oh, think this is a lymphoma. We do our FNA, we collect an RPMI, we look at our rapid onset evaluation, like it's squamous cell carcinoma. Do another pass, rinse the needle directly into formalin for your cell block, and then take the sample that you collected in RPMI and make two cell blocks and look at them and see. You'll see that the RPMI sample has fewer cell, has lower cellularity in my experience. Um, it's enough for flow cytometry, especially if you do it the same day, but it's not, it doesn't preserve the cells the way formalin does. Formalin is instant in a cytology sample. It penetrates a surgical specimen at one millimeter an hour, but with a cellular sample, that's immediate. So once it touches, it's done. And can the recording be availed after this, please? I would hope so. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So um, all the participants who have registered, they will um, receive a link uh, that will take them to the landing page at ASCP, um, where th these and other um, uh, sessions have been recorded and will be posted. Um, so yes, I absolutely echo um, Dr. Lowe's comments. Uh, just a really uh, um, amazing, fantastic, uh, informative presentation. It looks like we've got another question that's just popped up. Yes, it says, um, it's more of a comment from Dr. Duyemi. I think the filter method may be the most cost-effective for LMIC, though the yield may be low. Now, I had really good results with the filter method um, before I found out about the colloidin bag. For very small samples, it's all captured there. And I think it works really well. So give it a try and find out what works and what doesn't work and publish it for us. <laughs> and are there certificates after this webinar? I believe so. I don't know. Um, if they're for CME, I don't think that we're providing that uh, for this series, but we will, um, we can, we can clarify that as well. Um, and so we'll keep an eye out. I think we have a few more minutes. Um, Ali, I don't know if you have any um, questions. I have a couple, but if you have something that you'd like to, to ask um, Dr. Balasanian. I was just wondering if you could even share your standard personal protocol when you're performing FNAs yourself. Um, what do you do with your first pass? Do you mm. use that for both the smear and keeping it in the hub for the cell block or what, what's your standard um, method? I like to call myself the one pass wonder. <laughs> And if you go to my YouTube channel, there's like a three minute video about how to divide the sample into flow cytometry and saline rinse for molecular, I'm sorry, saline rinse for flow cytometry, which is what we used at MGH. We use um, RPMI here, formalin for cell block smears and additional smears for fish on the smear, which was the protocol we were developing there. But if, you know, we oftentimes with FNA biopsies will cover the whole slide. It's like, it's not necessary. Don't make it a pap smear, right? <laughs> Just make a tiny little oval if you can. And really the, the real trick is just pulling back the syringe. After you take the needle out of the patient, out of the lesion, the syringe plunger should be all the way down. You release the vacuum so that you don't hurt the patient. You pull the whole thing out then instead of taking the needle off and putting air into the syringe, pull that aspirate up into the syringe and you will still have enough material to work with in the needle. So practically what I do is I'll take, I'll do my biopsy and then release the suction. The plunger goes all the way down. Then I pull the needle out with the syringe attached. Then I'll pull the sample up into the syringe. And even if it doesn't look like anything is coming, it, it actually does in most cases. Sometimes it doesn't, but if it does, I will take that syringe off, set it down, and I always have a second syringe available 
and I'll express just the smallest droplet I can out of the tip of the needle, make a smear. I'll usually divide that into two smears. So I have a Gimsa stain and a Pap stain. Um, and then I will rinse what's in the needle into the formalin for cell block. And what's left in the hub of the needle, because there still will be some, I will rinse into RPMI for flow cytometry if I need to. So for a reactive lymph node that's benign and the patient wants the full workup, your first pass is going to be your best pass. If you do a dedicated pass on a reactive lymph node for flow or cell block, you're just going to get blood if you don't look at a smear, most likely. So um, by doing that, I've got everything already. And if I need to make a second pass, I'm still going to look at a smear of it. Everybody misses everybody misses once in a while. So even if you think you've got a good sample with a dedicated pass, there's a chance you did not hit it or you hit a small vessel in the lesion or a focus of necrosis. So if you're not looking at a smear for each pass, you may be missing an opportunity to recognize that you don't have enough material for cell block. Does that yes, answer your wonderful. question? Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, I just wanted to quickly follow up on this because I think, so one uh, big question is you um, clearly have ultrasound as part of your process, right? Yes. And so you already have um, a background, right, in terms of having a leg up on the um, quality of the lesion. Uh, but harkening back to um, days before we had ultrasound, right, which potentially could be a vast majority um, of our audience, right? So now we're dealing with, and probably this is how a lot of us were originally trained, right? When we're approaching a patient with a palpable lesion, um, clearly the approach is going to be different between solid versus cystic. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing is that you always, you know, some, some pathologists will do the, the French technique, you know, just using the needle, but it sounds like you always have a syringe attached and will apply vacuum. So I, I understand that, but potentially we can clarify. Um, but then, so that's one part is sort of to, to uh, maybe give us some brief brushstrokes about that aspect, trying to approach a lesion if you don't have uh, guidance of ultrasound um, or other um, information, number one. And then number two, if we have time to consider, um, you know, if you could share with us your approach, if you have a cystic lesion, you know, solid lesion, that's great, right? You, you know you're going to be able to um, have a good amount of material mm -hmm. to have a good cell block, but for a cystic lesion or mixed solid and cystic, right? How, you know, do you do anything additional to concentrate that material? Well, ultrasound has really improved my cell block, that's for sure. The needle stays completely in the lesion and ultrasound, the aspiration is done within the lesion, and it's great. Ultrasound has gotten much more cost effective. So um, hopefully it will be widely available, although I recognize that it's not now. If you're doing the FNA by palpation, um, you really have to stay focused, make sure your fingers aren't moving, your needles between your fingers, and you're staying in the lesion, which is the effect you get with ultrasound. I'll often teach our fellows to, to move their fingers in during the biopsy so that it they have one finger on top of the lesion. It's usually the, the middle finger or the index finger. And you can get a sense from the vibration where the tip of the needle is in the lesion. So you know when you poke through a little bit better. But if you do go through the lesion, you're going to get some of the surrounding stroma and that's going to dilute your sample. So I don't do everything with suction. I adapt my technique as I need to in different settings. So small lesions in the head and neck where I can't get a syringe in the right spot, I'll just do French technique, but I'll still take a empty syringe and pull the sample out of the hub of the needle into the hub of the syringe if I can. If that doesn't work, if it's still stuck in the hub of the needle, the other thing you can do is just one time push everything out of the needle tip onto a glass slide and let it clot on the slide. Um, so even though I, I sound like I only use one system, I'll adapt to different settings in different ways. If you have a small sclerotic lesion, you're not going to get a big flash in the hub or in the syringe, whether you use suction or not. Um, so in that case, I might force everything out of the needle tip onto the slide, get a little clot on the slide, 
and then just gently scrape it off either with a needle or with another slide that's been dipped in formalin and scrape that off into the formalin. Typically what I'll do is I'll make a smear off the surface of that and then take what's left on the slide as a little clot and then scrape that into the formalin. Um, suction helps, especially with sarcomas and um, for cystic lesions, solid and cystic lesions, when I'm always looking at my syringe when I have suction applied while I'm also looking at the ultrasound and the needle and the patient monitoring everything. If I see fluid is coming into the, the syringe, I'm going to hold the needle in one place until I can drain out all that fluid, try to sample the wall also in the same pass so I get the, the solid component. A nice trick you can do is when you express that onto a slide, be very, do it very slowly so you don't overrun the slide, but you get a drop of fluid and some tissue fragments on the slide. What you can do is then take your needle, <laughs> I have a good way to show this, but maybe I'll stop share here. Take your needle with the bevel down and just vacuum up the fluid around those tissue fragments. And you've got it nice and concentrated on the glass slide. Use that for your smear. And then you could take your fluid and either put it into, um, if you think it's just serous fluid, you could put it into liquid-based prep, or you can put it into cell block and it'll be spun down with whatever remaining tissue fragments are there. But very carefully and gently vacuuming up around, I like to call it, you know, bring out the vacuum cleaner to get the material around those fragments. And you get a nice concentrated smear and you figure out, is this a squamous cell or is it papillary thyroid carcinoma or something else that's causing um, the fluid to accumulate in the lesion? When and then for Dr. Henderson Jackson here has asked, do you ever use an 18 gauge needle for lesions not providing material on 23 gauge? I don't. Um, some cytopathologists do. I think if I can't get it on a 23 gauge needle with some soft tissue tumors just will not give. In that case, um, I like to think the FNA is not being done necessarily for a definitive subclassified sarcoma diagnosis. And I'll tell the clinician I'm not getting anything or I'm just getting rare atypical spindle cells. And we will send the patient for a core biopsy, which here is typically done with an 18 gauge needle, but it'll be processed by surgical pathology um, and you know, put into a cassette on its own. And I, I don't have a problem with doing an 18 gauge needle uh, FNA like that, but I think the radiology protocols will be, you know, closer monitoring of the lesion, checking for bleeding and hematoma and so forth than I can do in my clinic here. But if, you know, if you feel like it's safe and you can get a good sample that way, that's, go for it. <laughs> well, that was absolutely wonderful. I am so um, glad that we were able to convince you. I know it's a very short time frame, but that was just uh, absolutely fabulous. Provided a, just a great service. We've been talking about cell block. Um, techniques um, for um, for a while now, and just really, it's been um, uh, fabulous for you to um, step in and uh, bring us along at this junction, and and for us to be able to have your uh, presentation and your expertise available on the website. So, well, let's go ahead and conclude as we're qu quite a bit over time now. But I think that that is well worth um, the wait um, and the delay, uh, and we're really glad to have had you. And so, thank you so much. And, um, uh, and we'll see the participants uh, next time. Take care. Thank you. It's Bye. been my honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. So glad you could all join today. Bye. Bye-bye.